Good morning, Sheridan Hills. Welcome, welcome to our time of worship together all around South Florida. The church family is gathering around their televisions. We want to encourage you to go ahead, turn up the volume, and uh, get your your lyric sheets ready for singing. Uh, Hopefully you've been able to go to the website and print out some message notes. There's sermon notes both on the website as well as lyrics notes. So um, this morning we're going to be asking the question, does Jesus really care? Does he really care about what's going on in our lives? Does he really care about our individual lives? We're going to look at one of the great stories of the New Testament where we see the caring heart of Christ. Today today we come to sing together, crown him with many crowns, the Lord that is raised from the dead that invites us to enter into eternal life with him. So sit up at the edge of your couch or at the edge of your chair Uh, Straighten up your back, lift up your voice, and let's sing good and strong this morning. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon him. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. The Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, no angel in the sky can fully bear the sign, but downward bent his wandering eye. And mystery so right. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed for the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glory. Now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of hell, enthroned in worlds above. The King to whom is given the wondrous name of love. Crown him with many crowns as thrones before him fall. Crown him in kings with many crowns, for he is King of all. Sing all praise to him. All praise to him, the God of light, who formed the mountains by his might. All praise to him, who names the stars that sing his fame in skies above. All praise to him. Who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above, yet bends to hear our every prayer with sovereign power and tender care. All praise to Him whose love 
be seen in Christ the Son, the Servant King, who left behind His glorious throne to pay the ransom for His own. All praise to Him who humbly came to bear our sorrow, sin, and shame, who lived to die, who died to rise, the all-sufficient sacrifice. All praise to Him whose power and parts of God within our hearts, the spirit of all truth and peace, the fount of joy and holiness. To Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we lift, our wills we bow, to you the triune God we praise, with loving hearts our songs of to Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we lift, our wills we bow, to you the triune God we raise, with loving hearts our song of praise. Amen. Those are two great, great hymns that celebrate the great truth of this time of the year. Christ's sacrifice and his resurrection. Of course, that is what we celebrate every year. That's what we celebrate every Sunday when we meet together. We are excited about next Sunday as well, Easter Resurrection Sunday. And uh, leading up to that, though, this morning we come to one of the great stories of the power of Christ. The account, not merely a story, not a fictional story, but the true account of Jesus showing his power just before he would give his life for our sins. If you would, take your Bible and turn with us um, to John's Gospel, John's Gospel, and we come to John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is... Uh, the, the time of just the week before Jesus would go to the cross. And the week before he would go to the cross, be laid in the grave and raised again from the dead. Something very, very important happens in this week, and it's the, the picture of Christ's great power being shown toward others before being realized in his own life and his own resurrection. Notice there, if you have your sermon outline, um, I encourage you to have that. Always is helpful for you to pay attention. And uh, I'm ADD, so I need that a little bit. Um, I know that some of you are helped by it as well. But notice here with me in uh, the, the review, Jesus raised three people from the dead during his three-year ministry on the earth. First of all, we see Jairus' daughter. We also see the widow's son at Nain and Lazarus. So three times Jesus shows up, and someone who has died, they are raised from the dead. G Lazarus, let's notice here a little bit about him. He's the friend of Jesus and the brother of Mary and Martha. Now Jesus was, all, was close to all three of these. So this trio of brother and two sisters. This occurs, as we said, one week before Jesus Jesus' own crucifixion and resurrection. To me, that's very instructive. I, I was sharing with this group right here just before we began this morning that the, that the year that I realized this, as I was studying the Bible, it was very profound to me that just the week before Jesus himself would go to the cross, that his best friend, one of his best friends, would die and Jesus would show us what was about to happen with him, both in death and resurrection. This is such a great help to the disciples, if you think about it. The disciples, they, they didn't know what was going to happen, but as it all would come together, after these events would occur, they would be able to look at each other and say, Don't, it's amazing, don't you see what he did with Lazarus? And then if we think back to the widow's the widow at Nain, her son, when we showed up at the funeral and he, he rose him from the dead, and then Jairus' daughter, he was all along telling us that this was going to happen. Now it's all crystal clear to us. And so even just the week before Christ himself would die and be raised again, 
we see him very, very purposefully ordering these events, even the event of Lazarus' death, Mary and Martha's loss, so that Jesus can show up and show who he is. Look what it says here. Everything, look what it says. Everything God does, including his timing, fill it in, has perfect purpose. It has perfect purpose. God always knows what he's doing. Every word that we read in scripture, we see that God has perfect purpose and everything he is doing in the world around us. Yes, in 2020, everything he's doing around your life has perfect purpose. And uh, one of the things that's just important for us to recognize is John's gospel is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, It's not considered one of the linear, just... um, synoptic gospels. John's gospel is this work of art. It is, it is an amazing where Matthew focuses on so much from the Old Testament and all of the prophecies and Jesus fulfilling those. Mark is just a, a really straight, very concise uh, chronological um, depiction of the life of Christ. Luke pays a lot of attention to other details, details around them, details that are not necessarily from a Jewish perspective, But John has all of this beautiful imagery and all of this this really um, uh, glorious fitting together of the details of the gospel, of the life of Christ, listen to this, with deep and profound spiritual meaning. So look at this last statement under the review. It says, John's gospel brilliantly unfolds the narrative of Jesus' life in such a way that the profound meaning of every detail is brought into light. Uh, The more I study the book of John, the more I see deep spiritual meanings that that keeps floating to the surface that John is pointing out for us. And we see some of that in this narrative. Now, the the, the text this morning is 44 verses, but that is because of the glorious narrative that is here. And so I've asked the team here Um, to read with us. I hope you have an outline. If not, just have your Bible open. Go to John chapter 11 and see this glorious unfolding of Jesus's plan, his purpose, and his power as we see what happens with Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. So um, who's going first? Uh, TJ, go ahead and read the first section, and uh, then Alex and Robin and Christy and Pastor Jason are going to read. So follow along as they read. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. uh, Wait a minute. Alex, you're going to have to read verses 6 again. That doesn't make sense. Look what it says, everybody. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, what did he do? Read it again. When he heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Hmm. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he told, or he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. 
So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Well, look at verse 14. Can't miss this one either. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. Man, that sounds like Jesus is so cold-hearted. But we're going to see, actually, he has a grand purpose in all of this. Verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in their house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He said, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time the o there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. And I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. The, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. Jesus said, If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. We see this glorious picture of Jesus' compassion and we see his power in these verses, in this true account of God showing us and preparing us for the reality of of who he is. The first thing I want us to notice out of these verses, and what you'll want to do is you'll want to keep your sermon outline and the text, the sermon text, a little bit ready so you can go see where we get these things from. First one, number one, Jesus cares by confronting apparent impossibilities. Human beings have a bunch of things that in front of them in their power is impossible. That the realities of life, the realities of all of our physical limitations, the realities of sin bringing death and sickness and hardship into our lives, there are things that for us are impossible. 
But for God, the scripture says to us, all things are possible. And so one of the first things we see is that Jesus cares for us by dealing with the things that are impossible to us. Martha only sees, fill this in, Martha only sees the impossibility of the situation. She only sees that which is impossible. Look at verse 21. It says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she's recognizing her brother is dead. In fact, by this point, by the time she's having this conversation with Jesus, her brother is already in the tomb. She's looking at it as this is already done and it's over and there's nothing that we could do about this. If you go on and you flip the sheet and you look at the next part, in verse 39, we see her dealing with the impossibility again. Look at the impossibility that's there. Jesus says to them, he comes to the tomb in verse 38, it was a cave, a stone with a, that stone lay against it. In verse 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. Look what Martha says. Again, she's dealing with the impossibility that's in front of her. The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Now this is a rather grim thought to us. Um, we see that Martha's in front of her. It's not just about what she sees, but it's all of the senses are in play here, and she is re realizing this impossibility. But let's look and see what Jesus does with this. You see, we tend to magnify the problem. When we have a problem in this life, we are tempted to really focus on that problem. But Jesus wants to show his power. He always wants to show his power through the problems in our lives. That's the reality of what he does. There's prop, the disciples bring to him problems, and he shows his power. And that's what he wants to do with each one of us, is that we would come before him with the problems that come from living in a fallen world, and that we would see his power in our lives. Notice the next part here. As Jesus confronts our impossibilities, he does often involve us. He involves us with the work. He involves us with what he's doing. Again, in verse 39, we see this. Jesus is inviting them to be involved with what he does. How does he do that? Think about it. Look at verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Now, if he is about to raise Lazarus from the dead, couldn't he have gone and moved the stone with his, with his hand? Or couldn't he have said, stone, vanish? Couldn't he have said, everybody stand back, I'm going to blow it apart and blow the stone into a billion bits? Well, he could, but that's not what he did. What he did was, he said, remove the stone. And the crowd that's around him, some guys go over there and get a hold of a big, huge stone to keep animals out and keep everything else away and to maybe seal in the odor um, that is there. They go, and you can just imagine them covering their nose and several of them going over there and moving the stone from this cave. Now, there's sometimes when God is going to work in our lives and he's going to show his power, but he invites us to be involved with him. He invites us to be obedient. He has us to participate in his solution. It's not let's just stand back and watch God work. It's that he calls us to obey. And that obedience is to be in faith. Very often when you have a problem, God is going to show you something that you, that you need to do as part of the solution. And very often that is an act of faith. Now think about it. The guys, they didn't know what was, going about that, what was about to happen. They didn't know if Jesus just wanted to see the body. He missed his friend. He didn't get to see him before he went in the grave. Maybe he wanted to see the body. You know, we, we don't know what all they're thinking. But we know in faith that they obeyed him. Look at the next part here. Not only does Jesus care by confronting the impossibilities, but number two, Jesus cares by showing his real compassion for those he loves. Now there's two passages here that seemed that I kind of stopped Alex on to point them out. One of them was when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he didn't go immediately 
to where Lazarus was. He didn't go to Bethany right away. What did he do? He went on teaching where he was. He, it kind of seemed like he didn't care. But we see that Jesus was saying, no, oh, no, 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 no. I care very much, and I have a plan here that's going to show you who I am. It's going to show you what I can do. Um, so, but, but we see in verse 5, we see now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So from the very get-go, it's not an issue of a lack of love. Uh, the Apostle John tells us he loved them. These people were close to him. And in fact, when Jesus shows up in town and he hears everybody weeping over Lazarus, it says that Jesus wept, shortest verse in the Bible. Very, very clear. You heard Christie read it. He wept. And it also says in verse 38, he was deeply moved. Twice, in fact, it says he was deeply moved by Lazarus's death and by the mourning and the sorrow that was all around him. So Jesus shows real compassion. That's a good thing for us to recognize, that when Jesus looks at us in our problem and in our pain and in our struggle, that he really does care and he feels for us. In fact, there was one place where we see in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus comes up on the multitudes and it says that he looks out upon them and they were like sheep without a shepherd and he was moved. He had compassion for them. Our God is a God who has feelings. Our God is a God who has emotions and he feels for his people. Notice number three, and this is a big one for us, and this is in fact stated as the purpose for this whole event. In verse or number three, it says, Jesus cares by revealing the glory and purpose of God. He cares for you so much that he is going to reveal the glory and purpose of God over and over and over again as we walk the path of this earthly life. You see, letter A is every problem is an opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity for God's glory to be revealed. This was his exact design and intention with Lazarus's premature death. We see that God planned this that Jesus planned this. Look what it says in verse 40. Did I, not, did I not tell you that if you believe that you would see the glory of God? Martha is responding. She wanted Lazarus, but what she got was God. That's a beautiful thing for us to recognize. Very often we're wanting the thing that is right here in front of us that we've missed, but what we really need is God. We really need to see his purpose and his glory. Look at letter B. God designs for us to see his glory, not the solution to our problem. That is his design for us. God wants you to see his glory more than he wants you to see a simple solution to a problem. I remember when I was a kid growing up about two blocks over that way at 2118 North 39th Avenue, I remember I was taking math classes here in the building behind me and in that building right over there as a elementary grade student. And I remember as I moved up in math areas, different areas, I really wanted to go play in the tree house. I wanted to go run around in the woods that were behind the church here a whole lot more than I wanted to study and learn math. So I would often get myself in trouble, not be ready for math tests that were coming up. And so I would come home distraught and I would say, dad, I need help. And I would sit down with dad and we would sit at the dining room table and he would seek to teach me math. Now, my dad was an engineer, so he's a pretty good math teacher. Um, but I just always remember being so frustrated that as I was working through math things, I would get frustrated that I didn't understand how to do it. And I would say, dad, just give me the answer. Just give me the answer. Give me the solution. Um, so often that's how we are in life. We just want the answer. Just give me the answer. We don't really want to look up to what is behind the answer, which is the glory of God. And what God is far more interested in is in, in you just being given the answer. He wants you to look at him in the midst of the trouble. And so very often as we, as we experience the problems of life, God is doing a greater work, showing us who he is 
in the process. Look at letter C, or underneath that it says, we want the solution, he wants the glory. So that's the difference. We just want a solution, and he's saying, I want the glory. I want you to see who I am. I want you to see what I can do. Look at letter C. God's revealed glory, this is the revealed glory, God's revealed glory is the sum total of his attributes, that's his power, his glory, his, excuse me, his power, his grace, his love, his wrath, his judgments, his wisdom. When you think about all the attributes of God, revealed glory is the sum total of all those attributes displayed in such a way that it is impossible to notice this, to overlook them, circle the world, overlook them. When you start, when God's glory was re, is revealed, you cannot overlook them, you cannot ignore them, you cannot avoid them. You're going to see these things, but here's the amazing thing. In this present life, you might, fill it in, you might reject them. We see people that saw the glory of God and they rejected it. Right before their very eyes, God, through Jesus Christ, God would do miracles before them and they were not interested in that because they were not interested in his glory and they would reject that. But notice this, in this present life, you can reject these things, but in the life to come, you cannot. You will recognize who he is. You will recognize his glory. In fact, in Philippians, it says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. What does it say? To what? The glory of the Father. So there is coming a day when every human being will recognize his glory. The beautiful grace of God is you have the opportunity to do that now before it is everlastingly too late. And God is bringing about problems in your life so that you can see his glory. Friends, that's why we would say this whole issue of coronavirus is in part one of the great graces of God. This is God calling us to see our need for him. This is God calling us to see his power. I mean, what else has stopped the world in recent memory? I mean, nothing. Instead, this little tiny piece of biology that we can't even see with our eye has stopped the world. And God is saying, I'm calling you to look to me. I'm calling you to see this as a warning. It can get a whole lot worse than this. It will get a whole lot worse than this in eternity if you don't look to me. So part of this is, is that God wants us to see him, wants us to see him, and problems that come in our life can help us see him. Notice, notice letter D. Part of God's glory that he wants us to see is resurrection power. It's not just, you know, power to calm the wind and calm the waves. I mean, that's pretty big power. I, I don't know what just does that. Um, and it's not just power to heal a lame man, but it's power to take someone who's dead, four days dead, laying in a tomb that everybody's concerned it's going to stink, and say, live. This is power. This is resurrection power. And so we see this power. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, look at what it says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by what? The glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. You see, his resurrection is our resurrection. That's what the resurrection points to, is that we have a newness in life. And the amazing thing is that he allows us to start that now. That when we come to Christ, we have his resurrection power in our life now. It's not just one day when we die that we will one day be resurrected unto Christ. That's true, but his resurrection power is even for us now. Look at letter E. Part of God's glory is the union of the Father and the Son. 
This is part of the glorious nature of God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we see that in this passage. If you look at verse 41 and verse 42, Jesus stops before he raises Lazarus from the dead, and he says, now, Father, (laughs) I, I thank you for what you're going to do. And I thank you that you and I are on the same page. And I thank you that you have given me this work. And so it's important for us to see that Jesus is God. This is God coming to save us from our sins. This is God coming to rescue us, to pay the price for our sins. That's an important, very, very important thing. If you're new to the claims of the gospel, maybe, maybe you were raised in kind of cultural Christianity, but not really biblical Christianity. What you need to understand is that biblical Christianity is highlighting the fact that this Jesus was God come to die for our sins, to take the wrath of him of God upon himself so that we can live. And we see that they are on to, on the same page they are together. And verse 40 or verses 41 and verse 42 show us they have the same mind and they have the same mission. This is part of the glory of God. Look what Dr. John Piper says, and I love this quote. It really goes very, very well with this entire point, this entire message. Love is doing whatever you have to do to help people see and treasure the glory of God as their supreme joy, to help people see and be satisfied with the glory of God. Look at the first phrase. Love is doing whatever you have to do. Now, friends, if you think about Jesus close to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, Jesus knowing that they needed to experience losing Lazarus to see who he is. Jesus knowing that they were going to have to go through that pain as part of the process of them discovering who he really is. And not only for them, but think about that, for us too, 2,000 years later, because God has recorded this for us in his word so that we can see the way he works. So friends, there's going to be times when you go through some serious, hard things, and God is at work helping you turn and look to him so that you can see his glory and you can see his power. Um, he, he knows what he's about. He knows what he's doing. And so that's what true love is. Jesus loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. We just already read that. And now we see him working. And he loves them enough to let them go through some pain that is going to cause them to look to him. Now that is not part of the prosperity gospel message, is it? Prosperity gospel message says God never wants you to be in pain. Pain is only from the devil, and that is, that is, that is not at all going to be helpful to you. If you're in pain, it's because you don't have enough faith. The true message of the Bible is very different from that. The true message of the Bible is, is that all who are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be hardship, and God is working in the midst of all of that. Notice this at the top of the the next page there. The aim of love is to show people the glory of God. The greatest way you can love someone is to help them see and celebrate and rejoice in the glory of God. You know, right now, when people come up to me and they say, man, this coronavirus thing is really, really hard. There's a lot of suffering that's coming about from this. Um, It's not only the people who are sick, but it's also people that are really suffering financially, or it's people that are afraid. There's people that are separated from loved ones and everything else. And I, you know, I find myself just saying, you know, I think God is speaking through all of this. He's showing us how fragile life is. He's showing us that we don't know all the answers. He's showing us that we can be confounded by things. And he's showing us that we can't know the future. He does. And so this is a great time for us to look to God and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? And you know, people that God is calling to himself, he may use that very challenge for us to be able to 
challenge them to look to God as opposed to cursing God or thinking that, that we can solve these things. In his grace, he's doing that. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And God knows what he's doing to bring that about. The last point that I really want us to make here and to see from this passage is that Jesus cares by demonstrating the power of God. He doesn't hide the power of God. Um, At the beginning of his earthly ministry, for strategic reasons of the unveiling of who he was, he would say, my time isn't yet, my time isn't yet. But at this point, it is full on. Jesus is saying, watch this. Lazarus is going to die, and I'm going to go, and everybody's going to see what's going to happen. And I'm going to raise him from the dead. And this brings God glory, and it shows that he cares. Look at letter A. He, simply by his word, simply by his word, Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, he does the same thing with Jairus' daughter and the widow's son. He just speaks, and they live. Didn't we look at that last week, how he speaks and the world is created? It's by his word. And friends, he's given us his word. There's power in his word. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It comes down and it cuts into our life. And it can, it can bring to us the reality of our need for him. So there's power in his words. Notice this in verse 43. When, Jar- when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come forth. Now the word cried out here is a Greek word and it's used five times in John's gospel. And it's very interesting to me. Four times it's used by crowds calling for Christ's death. Think about that. Crowds calling for Christ's death. This time, in this usage of it, it is by Christ calling a man out of death to life. Um, there's different ways that you can say he lifted up his voice, he cried out. This verse, and this is part of the beauty of what John does for us. John shows us it's by this cry that we in our sin were calling for Christ to be crucified, rejecting Christ. But it is those very words, that very word, that Jesus calls us to life and calls Lazarus to life. Look at letter B. At the end of this age, at the end of this present age that we're in now, the resurrection of our bodies will be accomplished by the call of Christ's voice alone. So just like Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave is the same thing that is going to happen when this age is over and God calls everybody out of the, the, the place of death into the place before him. He calls us. Look what it says in John chapter 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. You see that? There's his words, his voice. And come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Two huge issues here. The power of his words and the way that he uses his words in calling us out of this. So just as what has happened with Lazarus is going to happen with us. Look at letter C. God's power was shown so that we may believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah that would save us from our sins. This is why God is showing us his power. He wants us to see this is Messiah. This is the one who came. This is the one who was promised, and this is the one who came to pay for your sins. And oh, by the way, this Messiah, it's God himself. And so the picture of this is that we can know that. Look at verse 14. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there. And why? I've underlined it there for you. Circle that. So that you may believe. But let us go to him. So even before they get to Bethany, he tells the disciples, I've done this for a purpose and so that you would believe. Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What is he saying? I am the resurrection and the life. So look at these four again. Kind of flip the page back. Look, does Jesus care? Well, I think you could ask Lazarus and Mary and Martha Martha, that question. And I think that they could say to us, yeah, he cares by confronting our apparent um, impossibilities. The things that Mary thought and Martha thought were just over, he can come and deal with that, and that's how he does it. He cares by showing us his real compassion. He weeps over us. He weeps over our loss. You know, some people have said, well, I think Jesus wept because of the unbelief. Well, actually, there's a lot of belief in these passages. Martha and Mary are believing. Um, and some people would say, well, he wept because the crowds around them, he knew what was going to happen. He knew that Jerusalem was going to reach. No, I think he wept because he loved Lazarus and he loved Mary and Martha. And he saw that they were in pain, that their brother had died and that the town was sad. Um, I, I think he wept because that was a loss. And Jesus meets us with that. Number three, Jesus cares by revealing the glory and purpose of God. Doesn't it help to know that God has a purpose in our suffering? Does it help you? You know, if suffering's just for suffering's sake, it's just because of the consequence of the fall, that's very sad for Christians if that's what you believe. But if you start to realize that, no, this sovereign God is in charge and he is saying, I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to make all this right, but not yet. And I'm going to do what's best for you, even when it hurts. Yes, I do care about you. And I care more about you seeing my glory than I care about your problem being solved right now. That's a hard thing, but it's a good thing. And then look at the last one there. We said Jesus cares by demonstrating the power of God. In a world of death and sin, we need God's power. And I hope and pray um, that you are experiencing his power in your life. Look at this. What is your response? Christ may be calling you to remove the stone to remove the stone so he can bring life. He may be calling you to take a step of faith and to believe in him and to trust in him. Will you believe in him? Will you obey him? That's that's the question. And so for Christians, maybe we just need to recognize that God is working in my life Yeah, it may be coronavirus or it may be other problems in my life. And he's calling me to take steps of faith. Just like those guys were called to move the stone in faith to to see what God would do. That God is calling you. Maybe it's to take steps of faith of spending more time in the, the word of God. Maybe it's to take steps of faith in giving a relationship that has been troubled to God. Maybe it's the step of faith of of trusting him with your, with your finances in a way that you never have. Maybe you've been in stress and fretting over that, and God's calling you to say, he's saying to you, trust me with this. Take steps of faith in this. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's the step of faith of prayer. You know, a lot of times we fret over problems, and we just sit there and think about them and think about them and think about them when he's calling you to get out of bed and go come be before him and Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. So, I mean, how do we apply this in our lives? I think we need to take steps of faith. Just like those men had to remove the stone from the tomb and see what God would do. Maybe you and I need to take steps of faith of saying, Lord, I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you and I'm going to be active obeying you um, until you move. And even after you move, um, I'd like for us to pray and, and ask God to show us that he cares um, in our lives, in the present struggles of our lives, that we would obey him, um, that we would consider where is it that we need to remove the stone and take steps of faith in trusting him. Um, I want to encourage you to where you are right now to just bow your head and to pray with me. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you this morning for the great account of Lazarus and your whole plan in these 44 verses. Lord, I thank you that you had a, had a plan to show your glory and help people realize who you are. Lord, I thank you that you have called us to stay with you, to abide with you in the good times and in the bad. And Lord, very often you're doing the most work when there's the most difficulty. Very often, Lord, you're doing the great heavy lifting of drawing our hearts to you when there's difficulty and hardship. Lord, I pray that you would help us to look to you and trust in you when the tough times come. Lord, when our hearts are sad, or Lord, when we don't know the future and we're afraid, Lord, when we're uncertain of how things are going to turn out, or Lord, maybe when we find a lot of sin in our hearts that separate us from the people around us as well as you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that you're calling us to see your glory. So Lord, give us hearts to believe. I pray that you'd give us faith to see what you're doing. And Lord, that our lives would be changed by knowing the God of power, the God of glory. In the name of Christ, we come and we give to you this time. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn that was written from Scotland um, over 125 years ago. And uh, I want to encourage you to notice the lyrics of it. It says, abide with me. Abide with me even when, when life's difficulties and maybe even death are upon me. The, the thing perhaps that uh, we are tempted to fear the most. And these beautiful words talk about what it means to trust in Christ, the call of abiding in Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. In life and in death, we abide in him. He abides with us. And uh, this present trial that we're going through can help us to learn to do that. Learn to do that better and better as we just seek him. Um, We are really glad that you've been able to join us today. I hope and pray that God has spoken to you uh, through these things. We want to take just a few moments and uh, pray together. Um, We want to pray for um, those who are serving in our medical community around us. Um, Just last night, I received um, a message from one of our doctors and that's in the life of our church that works at an area hospital. And he was going into surgery um, on a victim of coronavirus. And I cannot even describe for you uh, the gear that the entire surgical team has to wear in order to do that surgery. Um, uh, Very, very serious and ominous times for our medical community. Um, You know, in our church, we have several doctors, we have several nurses. And every day they are confronted with this. Um, I know that there are there are four ER doctors at a at another hospital not far from here, and uh, four of their ER doctors are sick, and there's only three um, that are typically on staff that are well um, as a result of this. So the medical community is very very much exposed, and we need to pray for our doctors and our nurses on this. Um, and so we're going to do that. Um, We also need to continue to pray that God would use this whole event to call many people to himself. And um, so we we want to pray about that as well. And we want to pray that God would be working in our church, in our own lives, giving us faith and hope in this. We know that there's some people in our church that are very vulnerable to this, and we want to pray for them. Uh, We want to pray that God would protect many of of our folks that have underlying health problems or are simply... Um, older in age. And uh, we want to pray that God would be protecting them. And so um, I'd like to pray for the medical community. I'm going to ask Christy, Christy, if you would pray for um, those who um, are maybe more more vulnerable uh, during this time. And um, Tommy, I'd like to ask you to just pray that God would strengthen our church during this time. Um, So um, let's bow to the Lord in prayer. We often pray for our church during this time, so we want to take just a moment and pray together for these three things. Let's pray. Father, we know that you're at work through these difficult times, and we pray that, Father, you would be at work in the hearts and in the lives of the doctors in our church and the nurses in our church. Father, that you would be working in them and strengthening them and protecting them. Father, we pray for all of the doctors and all of the nurses, um, not only in our community, but those that are serving all around the world. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen them, that you would give them courage. We pray that you would protect them. Father, I pray that even in the, in the, the lack of PPE equipment, Father, I pray that you would be divinely protecting them so that they can help those that are in need. Um, Lord, we ask this in the strong name of Christ. We thank you that you know every hair on our head. And Lord, we thank you um, that though you've given us a gift of eternal life, um, you also care and have compassion for us in our life here. Father, we just lift up those um, in our church family um, who physically are not at their strongest right now, who might be dealing with other illnesses uh, that have weakened their immune systems, those that are um, older and um, this would be difficult for them to recover from. Father, we pray for your special protection over them. Father, that you would just uh, put your wing over them and Father, that you would strengthen them through this time. And um, we thank you that we can trust in you and that we don't have to be afraid Um, because, Father, you care for us, you have compassion on us, and you help us. And yes, Lord, we just come before you. We want to lift up our church um, before you, Lord, and that you will strengthen us during this time, Lord, that you will keep us connected, 
um, with each other, but most importantly, connected to you through your word and through prayer, Lord. I just pray that you will give us just a, a, a renewed spirit for your word and for prayer and that we will come before you with humble hearts daily and, and want to, to know you and seek you and love you. And, and Lord, use that time and to encourage us and to help us and motivate us to, to reach out to our neighbors during this time, to help us to, to reach out to those that we haven't heard from lately, Lord. Um, and so, Lord, I just pray that you will just renew us daily in this, Lord, um, refined us through this process, Lord, the only way you know how, Lord. And, um, and may we just keep our eyes fixed on you through this, Lord, and, and, and turn to you and trust you and, and just know you greater because of all of this, Lord. And so I just thank you how you are moving in our community, how you are moving in our church, um, just by the testimonies that I'm hearing from people that I hear on the phone, Lord, and just the acts of service that you're doing, that people are willing to, to go out and help, um, you know, to, to help in, in the yards or bring groceries, Lord. We just thank you for just your, your marvelous grace in all of this and, um, and continue to, to strengthen us. And uh, may we just abide in you um, and daily and just enjoy and, and rejoice in, in who you are and how you have saved us, Lord. We give these things to you, Jesus. Father, thank you for just this time. Pray that you would go with us into this week that would be strong in you and that our hearts and our families would be um, melded together and also with you. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd make us stronger because of our time together and, uh, Lord, because of the time to to spend time in your word, spend time in prayer, spend time thinking about things that really matter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as Tommy prayed just now, there have been many, many testimonies of how God has been working in our church family. Um, if you uh, have any need, you need to just simply email info at sheridanhills.org. We want to help you uh, if you have a need. Um, there are, there's a whole list of people who are doing shopping for other people in the area. Um, so that's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, this week, our community group has uh, helped take care of us and we've helped take care of them. I hope and pray that you are connected with your community group. Now is a great time to do that. Today is a great day for you to do that. Right here um, on this afternoon, you have some time where you can reach out to other brothers and sisters, maybe even do a Zoom call and pray together. Um, that's a great thing to do. I uh, want to encourage you to, to just use all of the opportunities in front of us. Uh, real, real quick, we have been just very, very blessed by the church's faithfulness in giving. I want to continue to commend you for that. Um, our offerings are a little bit lower than they normally would be, but they've been strong. And um, I know that many of you are saying, hey, you know what? God has been faithful to me, and I'm going to trust him in this time. I'm going to be faithful in my giving, uh, supporting the ministry of my church. Um, we are doing everything we can to keep things together, reduce, obviously, expenses. Um, but I just want to encourage you to give faithfully. A bunch of people drove by the church last Sunday afternoon uh, to give, and I just want to say to you, uh, you can do that too. Um, from around 12 to noon, uh, excuse me, 12 to noon, from around 12 to 2 or 3, you can drive by the church and uh, there'll be a team here that you can just simply drop off your, your offering if you prefer to do it that way, or you can give online. The mailbox in front of the church office, uh, the one over in front of the church office is a secure mailbox and it's checked multiple times a day. So you can drop it in the mailbox if you miss uh, the team that'll be here um, uh, in just a little while on the, in the afternoon. So um, as well, Wednesday Bible study is going to be a rich time together. want to encourage you with that. Last week we looked at Psalm 119 from the bookstore, and uh, this, this Wednesday night we'll be together again for that. Special thing, Good Friday is this Friday, and Life in the Messiah with Stephen Cawthon is going to be making a special presentation um, on a Seder dinner, a Seder supper. It's a Passover observance with Christian perspective. I want to encourage you to click on our website Friday evening 
and watch the Seder video that's going to be available. A very, very uh, moving experience. We explain much uh, about the Passover. And then Easter, Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, let me just tell you, the, ser- the service is entitled, entitled Like Nothing You've Ever Seen. And we mean that in a few different ways. Like nothing you've ever seen, we are going to celebrate the resurrection. And listen to this the eternal impact of the resurrection. Very often we focused on Good Friday leading up to uh, Easter Sunday. Um, and that's a, that's a beautiful thing that we emphasize the death and the crucifixion of Christ, the, the burial of Christ. But then on Sunday morning, we emphasize the resurrection. Well, this Easter, we're going to be looking at the resurrection and beyond in a way that you have never seen, I guarantee you, on a Sunday morning. Is that right, guys? They've never seen this before, and you don't want to miss this? Listen, the resurrection of Jesus was a surprise to the disciples, and next Sunday, there is a surprise for our church, and it is going to be a help to your understanding of the big picture of the gospel a big picture of why God has done some very important things here in this life, all pointing to the life that is to come, that is in Christ, all pointing to eternity. So just get ready. Sunday is going to be a rich time. Uh, You don't want to miss it. Um, We're going to have a blast next Sunday. So um, plan to be here for that. Um, I I believe that you will be blessed. So uh, for now... We rejoice in the great grace of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus, the resurrection power of Christ. We pray that this week, as we consider his death for our sins and his resurrection for our life, that you will be pointed toward Christ. Keep checking the website. Keep looking at the emails. Notice the social postings. You'll be blessed as we go. In Jesus' name, we commend you into the week. Be blessed.